my name is Larry Achampong. Um, I'm an artist and I'm based in East London where I grew up and was also born. Jam in the Dark as an idea happened, I think for me, at a really kind of a uh, special time uh, of of growing as as an artist i was i was at the later stage of of my masters at the slade and you can you can imagine in in doing sculpture you have a lot of other uh, artists that are making works that are very figurative and and a lot of us want to make a um uh, a visual statement that will hopefully, you know, get us a show, a, a gallery, that kind of thing. And I think partial, that, that, that work partially emerged from my moving away from the anxieties of kind of uh, kneeling down to a pressure to make work simply just to sell. That, that, was, that was part of the original intention. Um, but also, I think when in, in Producing that work, I was, I was personally uh, introducing myself to sound as as a medium, and interestingly enough, whilst I was studying, I I would experiment with sound quite a bit, but I never really talked about it in my tutorials. So I would make uh, figurative or 3D based works and, and other kinds of things at, at the slate, very visual based works. And then during the evening, um, it, I, it was almost as if I was another person. I had my software at home. I would buy equipment bit by bit and I would just produce things. Um, I would hang out with um, other people that were interested in, in working with sound, particularly on a musical level. But then I kind of started to experiment more and more with the idea of, of sampling. Hi, I'm Barbie Hassanti and I am an artist and a curator and I'm based in London. The South London Black Music Archive uh, came about through, I suppose, a process of me looking at a, very, a kind of journey of other projects that I've done, really, because I started um, probably a few quite a few years before that collecting stories from people about music and memory um, and that became uh, a work that I made with a, a particularly uh, uh, two works that I made with two different sort of elders groups really um, and they were one was in in South London which was called Barbie's Karaoke um, and that was um, you kind of a lovely work with spending a lot of time with this Caribbean community and exploring music and singing and, and performing and um, looking at how their sort of stories of how they got to the UK through music. And then um, in Bristol, I, I worked with a, uh, a group that I, I it started off from from, the, from a particular club, nightclub, which was the first black music nightclub in Bristol, uh, which is called the Bamboo Club. And starting with the proprietor and spending time with the proprietor, sort of expanding that out until I met many, many members of the of the club. Um, and uh, then f from that, I sort of um, it was it was a commission by the picture this, and from that I put together this event of. Um, bringing like 70 members together and um, and also kind of collecting their stories um, and uh, transmitting those into young people and those those sort of became a, f a film piece a two-screen film piece that just kind of gave a sense of of the club and what's happening at the club and what's happening at the time so really looking at those some memories Well, hello, my name's Nicola Thomas. Um, I live in London and um, I work in London making art. So the work Imitation 3459 is, um, it's a film that I created and it's using the footage of the 1934 film Imitation of Life and the soundtrack of the 1959 film of Imitation of Life. 
Well, basically, how, how it came about was, um, it's a film that I'm very familiar with because my mum loved the film, my grandmother loved the film, so many women of their generation adored this film. And um, I would watch it a lot whenever they were watching it. And um, it didn't do anything for me at the time. I just found it very melodramatic and over the top. That's the Douglas Sirk version, the 1959 film, the colour one. And um, it was recently, it was about two years back, that I caught the film being showed, shown on television. And um, I saw the scene of Sarah Jane when she's confronted by her mother. Her mother's been searching for her. And um, basically, Sarah Jane tells her mother to leave her alone. And she says, you know, if you see me out on the street, don't acknowledge me, just pass by like you don't know me whatsoever. And in that moment, it was like I'd seen the film for the first time. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is horrific. It really, it really hit me. And I thought, wow, I'm really kind of reacting to this film on a, an emotional level, which took me by surprise. Um, and what I found really moving about that scene was the emotion of the mother. Um, because fair enough, you have Sarah Jane. Sarah Jane's freaking out. She's shouting at her mother. She's looking at her and telling her, look, you know, you know, I'm white, I'm white, you know, and all the rest of it. But for me, it was just how her mother was just as hurt, but it was all reined in. Okay, so my name is Kimathi Donko and I live and work in London. Okay, so Under Fire is um, a, a, a large oil painting which I made in 2005. And um, it's part of a series of works called Fall Uprising. And Fall Uprising was, um, a, a, it was, a, it was a, a series for a solo exhibition which I held in the Betty Morton Gallery in Brixton in, in South London. And so there's a certain site specificity to the series in that um, the idea of Fall Uprising was that <clears throat> 2005 marked 20 years since the 1985 sort of conflict between um, sort of members of various communities in London and the Metropolitan Police, and we could say the black communities in particular. And these conflict arose from two um, incidents, one in Brixton, the other in Tottenham, in which um, respectively two black women grandmothers sort of you know um had a, a very brutal encounter with the metropolitan police <coughs> and um one of those women was cynthia jarrett who um died on the i think it was the 5th of october 1985 um during a police incursion into her house in tottenham but a week before that um, and this, by the way, I should say that I say there's a kind of very contemporary thing about this because that thing with Cynthia Jarrett, um, that led to a protest at Tottenham Police Station. The protest then um, turned into a conflict between the police and the sort of residents of the Broadwater Farm Estate, um, you know, which is the sort of main Tottenham um, <clears throat> community, as it were. And this turned into the sort of famous Broadwater Farm um, you can call it battle, riot, uprising, whatever, um, in which Keith Blakelock, the police officer, died during this sort of fighting. Um, I'm Harold Offay, and uh, I live and work currently between Cambridge, London and Leeds, um, fulfilling various roles in each of those cities. So the origins of the covers project came from me looking at sort of popular cultural images. Um, I was really interested in this period in the 60s, 70s, 80s of kind of particularly within sort of black music, um, uh, sort of various artists. And I sort of just came across or re-came across, rediscovered this image of Grace Jones from her Island Life album cover. And yeah. It just sort of reminded me how I was always fascinated with that image as someone was growing up, because my mum had it, uh, the album. And 
Um, so that really led me to really thinking about the kind of sort of cultural currency of that image and sort of just doing a bit of kind of investigation, just the kind of whole kind of catalogue of images that Grace Jones, um, in collaboration with his French art director, Jean-Paul Goud, had kind of developed from the kind of late 70s onwards and then just sort of finding out things like you know, she studied theatre and, you know, obviously her experience as a kind of model, but on the kind of sort of disco scene in New York and all these kind of like lives that she'd sort of had and a really kind of distilled understanding of how to kind of create an image, how to construct an image um, that was sort of playful and kind of provocative. But within that, that island life image, it's sort of her in this arabesque pose um, on one leg, sort of, um, sort of semi-nude, um, but she sort of looks like this kind of sculpture, this kind of amazing kind of Amazonian object that's sort of androgynous but sexual and kind of, you know, all the things that Grace Jones embodies and still embodies. My name's Cedar Lewis and I'm an artist and um, kind of arts organiser. I live, I'm based in London, but I'm currently um, working in uh, Maastricht, Holland, uh, doing a year-long residency at the Jan van Eyck Academy. So basically, I've, so, so, so thanks again for asking me to do the interview. I'm really happy to do this interview. Um, yeah, and the first piece I, I thought would, I would talk about is this, a very old piece of mine, but I thought it was relevant to the conversation we were, we want to have. And it's basically this, it's, um, you know, I did, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's part of my degree show piece from 1999. And what the piece basically involved was placing an advert in the, in the issue, issue 47 of Freeze magazine from August 1999. Uh, or June, July, August 1999, which was when my degree show happened. And what I basically did was um, place a full page advert in the magazine, which was essentially a photograph of my mother, which said, isn't my mum the greatest, with an asterisk, and then had my name and the show details and a couple of adverts, which kind and, um, were, were kind of sponsorship, had a kind of cu couple of kind of thin things on there, which looked a bit like they were kind of sponsors. Actually, they were kind of sponsors of the show, but they weren't financial sponsors. But I, as part, part of the piece was I, I kind of wanted to have the, um, the aesthetic of an official advert. So that's why it was important for me to have those, those little details which looked like sponsors when in fact they they weren't you know they they wouldn't they weren't they wouldn't they didn't really uh, you know they didn't really have to be on there but I, I, I included them on there the whys and the wherefores I guess I could say um, uh, you know I studied at Campbell College of Art I did sculpture I graduated in 1999 a long time ago this is a very old piece but I thought for this conversation it was important and basically the what basically my, my thinking at the time it was it's kind of confused it was kind of like you know, it's kind of, there's something kind of quite desperate about it. You know, I was, you know, a young art student. I was fascinated with the art world. I was fascinated with art magazines. I used to spend a lot of time in the library poring over art magazines. And I kind of had the dream that, you know, maybe one day I could be in one of those magazines. Uh, my name's Tom Price and I live and work in London. I mean, network for me, it, it kind of contains within it a lot of challenges, a lot of questions I was asking myself coming off uh, the back of the show with um, Hale's Gallery with um, Angel Town, which was you know, the smaller figures. And I'd, I'd become you know, known, if at all, for my work on small scale. So small sculptures claiming a lot of space, sort of talking about monumentality, um, the plimps um, or the coloured bases and the plimps talking about, uh, or antiques and talking about kind of historical uh, kind of elements within the work and, and the kind of histories of uh, sculpture and, and, and people and, and these sort of uh, and status. Um, and so when it came to Network, which was based upon a smaller uh, sculpture I'd made, a three-foot sculpture, which was very much in the same vein as the, 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 the previous ones, just like the way I challenged, I guess, myself in terms of why don't I show the, the, the sculptural um, experiments of physiognomy with, from the animations. So why don't I actually show an object? Oh, I don't know, I, I should really look at that. I should try that. Oh, what, then from the, the nude figures, why don't I use clothing? Oh, I, I really should look at why, you know, really test, because I had a reason why, but let me test that reason why. And again, it came with a scale. So network is, is nine foot tall. I mean, it's a considerable leap from, you know, the, the original two foot tall figures, talking about they don't have to be big, you know, they still contain the confidence, they still contain a self-contained sort of, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if the viewer's there, they interact 
they, they draw the viewer in, um, they create this distance. Network was about confronting the idea of the monument head on. I'm Nicola Frimpong, I'm an artist, I live in Surrey. Life, life inspires me, but then I actually don't know. A combination of reality and dreams, a lot of fucked up stuff, a journey to the authenticity of the human mind, psychological diarrhea just shitting out. I've always used watercolours, acrylic at a very young age. I have always found them manageable. I tried oils and it was, you know, disastrous, so I just stuck to watercolours. I find it, you know, simple and easy to do, and I love the results. I also use pens to make the figures stand out. They appear bold and fresh. I've always used a softer, uh, softer paint earlier in my youth. It's an easy tool than Photoshop. Photoshop's just very deadly, just don't go near it. It's a touch of everything, uh, film, material, internet, people, life. I look at Dali, Otto Dix, Bosch, Hogarth, the Chapman brothers, Henry Darger and Marky Desaid. They just fed my imagination, but it's a, one's dream. I'm essentially self-taught. To be honest with you, I don't think about the audience at all. I couldn't care. You should be true to yourself, even if the world is confused by you. It doesn't matter. If you don't make sense to the world, you need to consider the possibility the world hates you. The world never wanted you. In all probability, the world despises you. It's only after you've lost everything. We're free to do anything. I've always displayed the work in series. The work has been framed to embrace the realness and power. A mix. People stating it's art. People stating it's not art. I have received a high volume of positive and negative comments from shows, my site, and in general. Um, name is Barbara Walker. I live in Birmingham and work in Birmingham. Well, um, I, I still have to go back to this work. This work, um, after I created it, um, and it was then out in the public domain, I. There was a point in 2003 where I started to critically question and I took time out, I think about two years out of my practice. It was necessary, um, you know, critically to think about what you're trying to say about, uh, still trying to define, I think, defining my practice and, and to reflect. And reflection is good. I think reflection is very good. And, so I, I moved away from my practice, even though, not necessarily totally move away, but in terms of creating, but although I wasn't creating work, I was critically, critically thinking about work. And during that period of not um, producing, making, immersing myself with my work physically, um, something happened one evening whereby I remember it really well, um, still, still fresh in my mind, um, clear as if it was yesterday that when my son came in and um, Solomon, then 17, Solomon is my youngest child. Um, it was, he's 20, 29 now. Um, and he came in and he said, um, mom, I've been stopped and I've been stopped again. And that was 2002. And I began to question him and he, through that whole conversation, he handed me these crumpled, one crumpled docket. And then later it revealed that he had several crumpled dockets. Um, <laughs> and, and it was funny because um, I was immediately felt really confused and puzzled and very ambivalent in terms of what I was dealing with.